All right, we are going live right now. Surprise. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Hello. Um, welcome to our 2024 Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series. To paraphrase James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is certainly true of the inequities that have historically shaped the entertainment and design industries, both on screen and behind the computer. We would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that the land on which we gather here in Stores, Connecticut, is the territory of the Mohegan, Manchatucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Gooden Hill Paguset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Today's event, Diversifying Design, Inclusion Through Mentorship and Collaboration, will feature a presentation by our guest speaker, Beatriz Lozano, followed by a Q&A featuring questions from our virtual audience. For our virtual audience out there on YouTube, please take advantage of the chat box there to submit questions for our guest, which we will try to get to answer during the discussion portion. My name is Heather Elliott Famalaro, and I'm a digital artist, documentary filmmaker, and most importantly, the department head for digital media and design here at the University of Connecticut. DMD is a young department founded in 2013, which has rapidly grown to over 350 undergraduate and graduate students and 26 full-time faculty. We have seven undergraduate concentration across the full digital media spectrum, film production, animation, interactivity, web design, business, and the humanities, um, both here in stores and at our regional Stanford campus. In our department, we value and celebrate our students' diverse backgrounds, and we support their development both as individuals and as professional media creators. Now in its fourth year, the Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series is one celebration of those shared values. Now on to tonight's show. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome tonight's co-hosts. We have Professor Clarissa, Clarissa Seglio, DMD student Kara Rondinelli, and early college experience student Sam Marcus. So Clarissa Seglio is a U.S. cultural historian trained in the interdisciplinary field of American studies who works at the intersection of museum studies, public history, and digital humanities. Much of her research focuses on the roles that artifacts, material, visual, and digital play in constructing national and social imaginaries within the context of museum work. An example of this is her book, A Cultural Arsenal for Democracy, The World War II Works of U.S. Museums, published by University of Massachusetts Press in 2022. Through her teaching and research, Seglio also collaborates with museums, libraries, and communities on interdisciplinary public-facing projects that engage diverse audiences in topics of contemporary concern. Welcome, Clarissa. And I'm also very happy to induce, to introduce our student co-hosts. Kara Rondinelli is a junior digital media and design major with a concentration in web and interactive media design. Her passion includes UI UX design, UX research, graphic design, fine art, and alternative music. Some of her work consists of high fidelity web and mobile app prototypes, graphic design, branding design, photography, and painting. Welcome, Kara. Thank you, happy to be here. And we welcome tonight, Sam Marcus. Sam is a high school senior and early college experience student enrolled in our companion class of the Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series here at UConn. He loves creating videos to educate people and wants to have a positive impact on the community and the people around him. Some of his works include documentaries, short forms, and campaign advertisements. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And now I'm going to turn this over to Professor Seglio. Thank you so much, Heather. It is truly my pleasure to welcome our guest today, Beatrice Lozano. Beatrice is a designer, typographer, and educator exploring how technology can push typography to exist at the intersection of the physical and digital world. She teaches interaction design at Parsons and was formerly a design director at Sunday Afternoon. 
Originally on the path to becoming a mechanical engineer, Beatrice shifted to graphic design as her involvement in immigrant rights activism exposed her to the power of visual communication. Her work has been recognized by the ADC, TDC, Communications Arts, and Print. In 2022, she was awarded the Art Directors Club Young Gun Award, which recognizes the world's best creatives under the age of 30. In 2023, she was a recipient of the TDC Ascenders Award and the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award. Some of her clients include ESPN, Target, and National Public Radio. Welcome, Beatrice, to our event this evening. We're so pleased to have you. Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'll go ahead and try and share my screen. So today I want to uh, share a little bit of some recent work I've worked on, but before that, I really want to dive into uh, my journey into becoming a designer, um, but specifically through the lens of diversifying design through inclusion and uh, achieving this through mentorship and collaboration. And this first part of my presentation is really just focusing on my start in the design world and now that i've been in here for a few years reflecting back on some of those early experiences uh, because often when i meet uh, with one-on-one -on -one on, with students this is the kind of questions they often have they want to know the details of uh, my pathway into design um, and so when it comes to diversity in design that's something i'm very passionate about i'm a latina uh, designer I'm also a first generation college student. And so I think uh, we are all complex individuals with many facets to our identities. Um, so I often think, you know, how do our identities impact the work we make and our design process? And something I've been thinking about a lot these last few years is this idea that we all design with an accent for those of us who are designers. You know, I know there's some filmmakers in there. I believe you're also uh, creating films with your own accent. And this idea of an accent is something I've thought about a lot because firstly, my primary, my first language was Spanish and I didn't learn English until I started school. And I also just grew up around a lot of people who were still learning English or were learning English as I was growing up and just observing the role of an accent, especially within an American context. And then I think it can get quite complex and interesting when you begin to take into account the different types of accents there are and why some accents are treated with more respect than others. Um, but the way we have verbal accents, I believe it's the same thing for our own visual expression. So. Uh, when I'm thinking about an accent, I'm not just thinking about our cultural or racial backgrounds, but even, you know, like where you grew up, uh, maybe, you know, you grew up in the South and that really influences your work or you grew up on the West Coast and we're going to see some of that. Um, so I think all, all of these interests that we grow up around or surround ourselves with come through in our work. And a really great article that also touches on something very similar. Uh, it's this article that I really love for anybody who's interested in reading it. I added a QR code, feel free to scan it. Um, and it's breaking down power structures and navigating tokenism, building community and design education by Kelly Walters and Anushka uh, Kwandwala. And similar, similarly here, they say the way you make is intertwined with who you are. And I think this is touching on the same very uh, topic. And I think this is really important because um, how we make is um, often not perceived how we intend to make our designs. And so the recipient of our designs can hold a lot of power in our future as we're navigating uh, our careers. And some more resources that I wanted to share with you all. These are just some recent books that have been released that I really love and influence the way I approach my design work and the way I approach 
uh, my design thinking and uh, currently I'm teaching a 3D class at Parsons and during our first class I had my students read uh, I think it was chapter two of uh, the Decol Decolonizing Design book and we just had a really fruitful conversation around the repercussions of technology uh, because we're trying to learn this new evolving technology as you'll see in some of my work I'm about to present like augmented reality or artificial intelligence but I think it's also really important to understand the context in which this technology is made possible um, so highly recommend it for anybody who hasn't read it and also you know being able to reflect on what's happening currently uh, in Congo when it comes to the cobalt mining. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I meet with many students one on one, and especially a lot of BIPOC students. Uh, often, they want like a play by play of like how I was able to uh, get the career that I've been able to have. And firstly, I'll say uh, I'm now 30 years old. I moved to New York like seven years ago. You know, life is changing really quickly. We've had a pandemic in between those years, so uh, the design world what it was when I first entered it is very different than what it is now uh, in both a positive and maybe negative way. Uh, and we really all just have to find our own ways. But I do think there's some like underlying lessons in some of my uh, first jobs when I was entering the field. Um, so for a little bit of context, um, this was a chart I found. This only goes up to 2017. Um, so I would be interested in finding a more recent one, but here we could see the uh, demog racial and ethnicity breakdown of design students, um, where we're already seeing this huge gap between white students who have are leading by over 50%, followed by Latino students, uh, black students, and so on. Uh, for me, I attended the University of Michigan. So these demographics looked a little bit different. If I'm remembering correctly, I think we had like 5% or less Latino enrollment and 5% or less of black enrollment, um, which I think it's a very um, stark difference even to this chart that we see here. And on top of that, when I was studying design, I never had a Latino design professor, especially not a Latina design professor. Um, and so for me, over the years, I've learned the importance of being able to see yourself represented. And it doesn't mean you have to take classes with somebody who comes from your background. Um, but I think, you know, this is why I think these types of events and talks are so special now, because any student from anywhere in the country can find a recording and hopefully see themselves represented in some way. And so my journey to design, uh, as it was mentioned, I was originally on the path to becoming a mechanical engineer. I grew up in Michigan. They have a great uh, engineering school over at the University of Michigan, um, which was my original plan. Um, I, during my first year, became involved with a lot of immigrant rights organizing, um, and which is how I became exposed to the power of visual communication. And I began to design posters and flyers and uh, during my time in college, once I decided to make that jump into um, the design program, my first design job was at this place called the NCID, which is the National Center for Institutional Diversity. Uh, this was an incredible job. Uh, I also, which is why I was really excited about this talk, uh, this topic of diversity, something that I've thought about, you know, since the very beginning of college and I've been involved with in different capacities. Um, and here at the NCID, I was working as a designer, uh, but often uh, I'm always, you know, hesitant to show old designs, but I think we need to all get over it and it's okay to <laughs> improve with our design. So on the right are some examples of the work I'll be doing for them. So I'll be working directly with researchers and scholars and visually translating some of their research papers and their findings just to help disseminate this really important information. And it just gave me the opportunity to sit in on all of these amazing conferences and meet people from all over the country. Um, this job was also really special for me because as I mentioned, it was my first design job. Um, so before that, I had only worked like blue collar jobs when I was in high school. 
Um, shout out to anybody who's ever worked, you know, the fast food restaurant, you know, the struggles. But uh, with this job, it was uh, the first time that I began to realize what it meant for me to be like this white collar designer. The fact that I was able to go into a really, you know, comfortable office every day and sit at a desk and have a cup of coffee and essentially like get paid to make visuals. That to me still like blows my mind every day that I get to do that. Um, so I'm always very, very thankful. And I always remember this job when I think about that. And as I mentioned, simultaneously while I was working uh, at the NCID, I was still very involved in student activism. And so this is essentially how I found my way into design. I met a bunch of uh, students who were um, organizing around uh, tuition equality for undocumented students. Um, so at the time, undocumented students were being charged uh, international tuition rates at Michigan, meaning triple uh, the in-state tuition, they also didn't qualify for FAFSA, FAFSA or any type of scholarship. So essentially, uh, it was impossible for them to attend the university, even if they were 4.0 students. Uh, so for us, this was a very tangible way where we saw, you know, we only have a 5% Latino enrollment. There's a huge undocumented Latino population in Detroit, um, but they have no pathway to uh, attending a higher education program. Um, and so through this organizing, uh, I realized that a lot of my peers were making their flyers in Microsoft Word. And at the time, I just had access to Illustrator. So I offered to help design flyers. And that's essentially how I began to learn what design was. Um, also, at this time, I didn't even know that you could do this for a living. Uh, many of these I made while I was still studying engineering. This is what I would do for fun at night. Uh, it wasn't until uh, a friend of mine let me know about this whole world called graphic design and that you could get paid to do this, um, which for me, I think uh, we all have our own paths into design. I think if you're like myself, like a first generation college student, or you're coming from like an immigrant background, you might not be raised around people who get to have creative uh, careers for a living. So it might take you a little bit longer, but you know, we'll get there eventually. And so uh, after graduation, uh, my dream was to move to New York. Uh, at the time, I really believed that, you know, New York was the best place to study design. It's where all the best designers are. Uh, obviously, that's not true. Best designers are everywhere. Um, but one of my first jobs uh, I was able to get in New York was at a small agency where I was working as an intern. Um, and our producer there uh, is Kai Lawson, uh, who for me was an incredible mentor. And at this job, uh, I'm not going to name, I'm not going to name names because I know this is a recorded uh, video, but uh, at this job, there was a racial incident that happened where uh, somebody who was in a really high up position made a uh, racist comment, xenophobic comment against Latinos while I was in the room. Uh, Kai herself is Latina as well, um, and I remember after that event happened, it was so wonderful to be able to have somebody at that job who understood and to also, you know, we just, I remember grabbing coffee and we were just having like a good laugh about it, which was really cathartic. So uh, that moment just really helped me realize the importance of having a diverse set of uh, people in leadership positions and in higher up positions. Um, and not only from that moment, uh, I mean, Kai is just a powerhouse and you should all uh, look into her work. She's uh, pretty big now, I think, in the advertising world. She runs, uh, co-runs this amazing podcast where they talk about being Black in the ad world. Um, but this was my first job once I moved to New York and it was really special because she really was an excellent mentor. So um, not only in the agency with what we were designing, but I remember when I first started, she paired me up with a more experienced designer um, to, help, to help me and guide me. And then um, she also really showed me the importance of networking. So even outside of work or during work hours, she would schedule myself and the other intern to go to these design mixers or go to these talks. Um, and that for me really uh, shifted the way I understood uh, how to navigate the design world. 
Next up, I worked at a really, uh, these aren't all my jobs. I had so many jobs, so I only <laughs> thought, don't worry, it's not, I'm not going to go into all of them. Just uh, the ones that really had a big impact on me. Um, and so Morkless Key is a small branding studio uh, in Brooklyn and ran by uh, John and Weil, who you could see here. And I have just been a really big fan of their work, but I actually learned about their work by attending a design lecture. Uh, so once again, I think all of these are connected. You know, Kai teaching me the importance of going to these design events and putting myself out there and learning how other people were thinking and designing was really important. And so um, with Morcos Key, I I've worked with them at a program called uh, Designer in Residence, and they still have this every year, and I always recommend students apply. Um, it's this great uh, program where you're, are, you're brought into the studio to help with their client projects, but also simultaneously um, they guide you as you work on your own personal projects. And so this for me, the takeaways is here that we could see on the right was really important for the way I now navigate when I'm working with younger designers or when I'm working with students, uh, really understanding the importance of uh, helping them grow in their own personal work as well. And then um, lastly, uh, I forgot to change the name, I'm so sorry. This is Sunday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, everybody. It still says Markowski at the top. Uh, but this was a studio I was involved with for almost five years. Uh, they are like my family to me at this point. I left a year and a half ago to go uh, full-time freelance. Um, and this was the studios led by JC, Juan Carlos Pagan, and then Amit Klink. And uh, this studio was really special because once again, I was able to benefit a lot from this one-on-one -on -one mentor mentoring uh, from both my creative directors. And specifically at this job, I remember grabbing coffee with JC when I was first beginning this job. And he was just asking me what I hoped to get out of this job. And I remember saying that I really wanted to grow um, when it came to uh, seeing a project through from start to finish and being able to pitch it to clients. And so I think that's very rare. The longer I've worked and the more people that friends that I've met in the design world, very rare that a creative director would be like, how can I help you grow? And let me give you those opportunities. Um, so I just feel very grateful that I was able to find all of these incredible people along the way. Um, but I also will say it wasn't an accident, like it wasn't an accident that I was working at all of these places. I really, you know, put in a lot of work and thought uh, when it came to networking and seeing people speak and being self-reflective to understand uh, whose work and uh, approach to design really resonated with me. And this one also just showed me the power of collaboration. We were there are a really multidisciplinary studio. So Ahmed is a filmmaker, photographer, JC is a typographer and designer. Um, so we were constantly working across different medias, which was really exciting. And so from all of these highlights as I was entering the design world, two things have really stuck out to me, and that is the importance of mentorship and the importance of collaboration. So I want to share a couple projects uh, that really touch on these. Um, and I will probably say that these are, you know, my favorite projects, but they really are all my favorite projects. Uh, so this first project was a self-initiated um, attempt to learn how to design a typeface. And this was the first typeface I designed, and it was called Ancho. And so Ancho is a variable sans typeface. Uh, from the very beginning, I always loved motion. So I knew that I wanted this to be a variable typeface. Um, and the idea behind it was uh, this typeface is inspired by the Ancho pepper that we use in Mexican cuisine. And the original idea was to um, design a typeface for all of the different peppers. But as I began designing, that was very uh, complicated and that was a bit over my head given that I had never designed a typeface before. So I just went with the sans serif as we could see here, but really went all in on it. Um, and again, to tie it back to this idea of mentorship, 
this typeface was also really special for me because I was working on this while I was at Sunday afternoon. Um, and my creative director, JC, would help me. Uh, he had previously co-ran a type boundary. He's also a type designer himself. Um, so he would see that I was working on this personal project. And I remember him just encouraging me to continue to design it. Whenever we had downtime from client projects at the studio, I would just print out all of these different proofs. And he would just go through and make all of these marks as to how I can improve it. Um, and again, I thought that was really special because uh, I think it's incredible to be surrounded with um, co-workers uh, who really want the best for you and to want to see you grow outside of the client work or outside of you know traditional design. And so as I mentioned here, a little bit graphics of the inspiration. So originally it was inspired by Peppers, but then as I began designing it, there was a lot of architectural influence as well. Uh, particularly, I was really influenced by the original architecture of Mexico. So things such as the Totihuacan pyramids. And here we could see how this works uh, from the ultra bold at the very top to the thin version at the bottom. And we have some alternates as well, which is one of my favorite things about designing a typeface. And then, as I mentioned, this really just was a personal project for me to learn new things. So once I had the variable font drawn, uh, this was a few years ago, I think this might have been 2019 now, um, there really wasn't an easy way to animate a variable font without code. So I had to learn uh, some Drawba using Python to animate this that we see here. Uh, now there is a great plugin on After Effects called Very Font for anybody who's interested. Uh, this was another COVID animation exploration. And because this typeface was inspired by architecture, um, I also explored what this typeface could look like in 3D, the way we see here. And then for its release, I reached out to a group of good friends who were designers um, and asked if they would be kind enough to uh, create a poster using a typeface. And I think this is what makes uh, type design really special compared to branding, which I often am working on, is that with type design, it really is just the initial starting point. Once you make your typeface, you put it out in the world and you'll always be surprised with how people will use it and it will continue to take on a new life. Um, but with branding, it's pretty much the opposite where you make the brand guidelines and you're just really hoping that the client will follow all of your different rules exactly the way you set them. And after this typeface was released um, in, I think this must have been 2020, uh, AIGA reached out to see if I was interested in uh, designing a get out the vote poster uh, for this campaign they were working on. They were uh, gathering 100 posters to celebrate uh, 100 years of women's right to vote. And I always like to share this story because uh, I, th I think this was also a big learning moment for myself. I remember when I got that email, firstly, I was incredibly flattered because there were people who were contributing posters, including like Paula Cher, who I really admired. Um, but at the same time, I felt very conflicted because my first thought was one who, as like a Latina woman, somebody who's very interested in diversity, especially when it, when it comes to racial dynamics, especially in this country, um, that just didn't really sit right with me because I think we still have quite a ways to go before we can really celebrate 100 years for all women. Um, and initially I was going to turn down the opportunity for that reason, but instead I decided to find ways to use our design to make um, this topic a little bit more inclusive. Uh, so I have the word boat here, design and agile, and then I strung in all of the different reasons covering different uh, underserved communities as to why you should be voting. Uh, so to protect LGBTQ rights, to end police brutality, to support indigenous communities, and so on. And here we could see a closer up version of this design. And once I posted this on Instagram, the poster was, was really well received. And I went ahead and had this idea of creating 
physical, a physical shirt. Uh, and with the support of the studio that I was working at, we printed all of these shirts and all of the profits went to uh, a nonprofit that helps people get licenses so that they can vote. Um, and so once again, this project was just a really great learning moment for me because if I had turned it down, I think that really wouldn't have helped anybody or really wouldn't have made a uh, positive impact. I think it would have been okay for me to turn it down. I think we're always justified to leave spaces that we are that don't serve us. But uh, for those of us who feel like we have the capacity to stay, I think uh, there's always ways to turn a project around and hopefully uh, help people think about things a little bit differently. Um, another thing I really loved about this typeface is uh, it always just takes on so many lives. So, you know, it allowed me to learn how to design a typeface, how to code with Python, encouraged me to continue evolving my motion skills that we could see here. Um, and then once this project was also released, uh, Apple Music reached out and they were interested in using this typeface for their uh, Latin Heritage Month campaigns. I think this was in 2020 and 2021. Uh, I think they did a really beautiful job here pairing it with the illustrations. And I also really loved uh, their animations here as well. And this was a really special moment for me because it was a reminder of the importance to put your work out there. As I mentioned, Nacho was not, you know, a school project. It was not a client project. It was just a personal project that I was taking on to learn a new skill. Um, and I never imagined that they would, you know, grow and take on this new life. So I always encourage students to, you know, put your work out there, even if it's not perfect, even if it's not refined, because you never know who's going to resonate with your work. Um, here, this was last year, Ancha was used in the uh, museum design over at the Museo Franz Mayer in Mexico City. It was used in a uh, branding design for a coffee shop in Monterrey. It was also used for a voting campaign a couple years ago uh, in New York City. And then perhaps my favorite, it was uh, used by a group of women for the 8M March uh, in Mexico City. And then recently, um, I think this might have been the end of last year or a couple months. I'm always losing track of time. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> but. Uh, it's used in the title lane for a film called A Million Miles Away, and it's paired with one of my favorite typefaces called Jabin, designed by Frida Medrano, which is this really cool variable black leather, so you should definitely check out her work as well. Um, the next project I want to share with you all is uh, an augmented reality extension of a mural. And this was a collaboration with my good friend, Lin Yun. Uh, this is a recent project um, that we worked on less than a year ago. And to me, this is uh, the kind of project that constantly reminds me of the power of collaboration and the importance of collaboration. Uh, so this is Lin's mural. It's part of this uh, incredible campaign called You Are Not Alone. Um, and every year they uh, gather a bunch of different artists and have them paint murals. Um, I think it's throughout the country, but definitely here in New York City. And Lin is Korean, so she painted her mural in Hangul, which is a Korean written script. And it translates to You Are Not Alone. Um, always a really big fan of her work, but I just really love this mural. So um, together we decided to um, expand this mural and reimagine what this could look like in a 3D and augmented reality world. Uh, here's Lynn, how that work. Uh, also another benefit to collaboration. I've helped uh, my former creative director with a mural once and he's like, you can go home now. Thank you for all of your work. Not all of us are cut out for, you know, for the fine brush work. Some of us are better behind a computer. So um, I think often for young designers, we feel this pressure to learn every skill set. Um, but I think, you know, it's a huge benefit of collaboration. You really don't have to learn everything. You don't have to put yourself under that kind of pressure. Uh, instead, I would recommend you just, you know, find friends and find collaborators who balance you out and have different skill sets. 
Um, and so here we could see a little bit of why Lynn's mural is so special. So on the left, we see um, the way this phrase is being typeset in traditional, traditionally in Hangul. So if you were just typing it in like Dropbox or Microsoft or wherever you're typing. Um, and then on the right, we see her expressive uh, lettering take on it. Uh, so this is still something that's very uh, new when it comes to scripts outside of Latin. More and more in these last few years, we're seeing uh, letters and type designers really pushing the boundaries of how expressive they can be, uh, which I think is really exciting. And that's why it's also really important for us to foster spaces for letters and type designers who um, aren't always, you know, uh, primarily English speakers or uh, based in Latin, in the Latin scripts. And so the expressiveness of her leathering style really inspired how we approach the 3D, the color, the motion. Here we were experimenting with uh, different approaches. Like on the left, we were exploring, like what if we had photos of Korean dishes on the Z axis, like on the extruded sides of the leather forms. In the middle here, we're playing around with bringing in different colors to um, play up the rhythm of the motion. On the right, we're playing around with um, adding like a secondary line of type on the sides. Uh, I also just love this screenshot on the right because it shows the importance of prototyping. Like not everything has to be really refined. It's important to just learn how to, you know, work through your ideas. And um, I think a really special moment in this project was when I was first beginning to create the 3D form of her mural and animate her mural. Um, the motion was very limited and very rigid, and that was primarily due to the fact that my only languages are English and Spanish. Both both of them are based on the Latin alphabet. I cannot read Hangul, so I was really nervous to um, make the letter forms too expressive in a way that they would no longer be legible. Um, but Lynn was very kind, and um, on the top left, this is what she sent me a, a text message of, is Hangul is a modular. Uh, writing system that remains legible when modular components are separated. Um, so as we can see here, both on the top and the bottom, they're spelling out the exact same thing and they both remain legible, um, And which is very different from the Latin script. It's not like you could break apart letters like that and they could still be legible. Um, and just having this new understanding and knowledge helped me approach the motion in a way that was much more expressive. And uh, you know, I think there's close to 300 written scripts out in the world. There's, it's impossible for one person to be able to uh, learn all of these scripts and read them. And I think that's really not the point. Again, I think it comes back to the power of collaboration. Like if there isn't somebody who is an expert in Hangul who is in the 3D AR space in the typography world, that's okay because like we can collaborate and then we can make this piece that lives in both of those worlds. And so as, as I was approaching the motion, Lynn also provided this reference that she really loved, uh, which I thought was a really great point of inspiration, seeing how all of these um, different rigid elements were working together to create this fluid movement. And you can see that influence here in the final design. So here we ended up going with the alternating colors on the Z axis. And uh, here we're seeing uh, the mural oscillating in the X, Y, and Z directions. And this is what it looks like on site. So this version is an image recognition mural. So if you had the design open on your phone, uh, this is at the seaport in Manhattan, you would just walk up to the mural, point, point your phone at the mural, um, and then this design, the 3D would show up in front of it uh, the way we see here. Um, for those of you who are iOS users, I also made this at home version. You're welcome to test it out. Uh, unfortunately, this version only works with like iPhones, uh, which leads us to a whole conversation on accessibility with emerging technology. But I think that's for another lecture. Um, but happy to continue discussing that maybe in the Q&A. Um, but for those of you who are iOS users, you can scan the QR code and then just point your phone at a flat surface. Um, this piece does have audio, so it's a recorded audio of Lynn 
explaining her process in Korean and the meaning of the mural. And for those of you who do have the mural open, you can then pinch the scale and place it around different places uh, in your room. And I also want to share a little bit um, about my uh, journey into education and a little bit about my teaching experience. So I've been teaching at Parsons since 2021. Uh, I've been teaching different courses, uh, all touching on interaction. Um, on the left here, uh, this is some work for my uh, interaction, core interaction one students from a couple years ago. Um, and in this assignment, I had them read Annie Albers on weaving, then I had them reflect on their own cultures and backgrounds and just the fashion or just the fashion that interests them. And they had to select a uh, textile and then recreate it using code uh, to learn how to code with loops. Uh, in the middle, we have my students here from last year uh, who I missed. That was such a really wonderful class. And then on the right is a video for my current students. And this class is on spatial design. Uh, this is a five week workshop style class that I've designed. And in this class, students are learning how to think in 3D. Um, so here they're learning how to translate something like a piece of paper that is almost essentially flat and 2D and how uh, we can begin to translate our 2D thinking into 3D. We're also covering uh, AR scan, I mean 3D scanning and then image recognition, augmented reality. And um, one thing that I find really important, especially uh, teaching at Parsons is that our students are very diverse and the majority of the students are coming from international backgrounds. Um, reflecting back on my own experiences of when I was a student and not feeling represented or not feeling like I ever had like professors who understood my perspective or the kind of work that I was drawn to creating. Uh, usually I do this when I have like a full semester a class, like a 15 week class, but I have students typically on the first day take an hour or so to create this uh, mood board essentially of work that inspires them, of work that they deem as good design, uh, because that to me is really important. I never want students to design like me. I don't want to remove their perspective on design uh, and to push them to, to design an aesthetic that's more American. Uh, instead, I want to better understand, you know, what they are what they see as good design and uh, help them become you know better designers better versions of themselves when it comes to designing and i have definitely seen some trends and correlations so students usually typically from like certain areas might be drawn to maybe uh, designing more with pastels or really thin type and really small type and which is very different often from like american design that's really bold and colorful same goes for mexican design really bold and colorful um, and so I find this exercise to be really helpful also as I'm just grading their work to be always be able to reference like this is what they're striving for. And so how can I help them get to that point in their own work. And I think that's also really important because Also, I'm only just one professor in the classroom with sometimes 15 students, you know, I will never be, you know, the, the exact reflection of who they are. But I think if we're trying to understand each other's backgrounds, we can help uh, guide each other a little bit better. And one thing, another thing that I've really enjoyed when it comes to teaching is just meeting a lot of really young, talented, and passionate designers um, who are just about to enter the design world and are just really eager to make a difference. And uh, because I'm still you know, practicing designer, uh, one thing that's been really rewarding has been able to bring on some of my students um, to the client projects I've been working on. And this is one example of uh, one of these projects. This was the uh, branding for the Tide Film Festival, which is an incredible film festival here in Brooklyn um, that showcases the work of filmmakers of color. And uh, Tide already had a brand, uh, so this was a rebrand. And uh, this project was just a lot of fun because it allowed me to touch on a little bit of everything that I love. So drawing a custom wordmark, customizing the typography, building out a whole system. 
And this film festival is really uh, inspired around this idea of positive disruption. And with the name Tide, um, that drew us to the idea of a tidal wave, uh, which we then implemented here in all of the ink traps here in the leather forms. And so here we could see more of the identity. I won't go too far into the typography. I know not everybody here are type designers, but um, as I mentioned in the word mark, we were inspired by this idea of a tidal wave, which we use the negative form in the logo. Um, and then we pulled that same form out and just repeated it to build all of these different patterns uh, that became these animations that you also saw, saw overlaid the footage. Um, and so this project to me was very special in many ways. One, because I had a good friend working over at Tide, so I was able to collaborate with him. Um, but also because it was creating this identity for a community that I'm really passionate about. Um, and it's just, you know, one of those projects that I really would have loved to work on when I was a student. Um, and here we could see uh, more of the identity and so as I mentioned, I was teaching interaction design. Uh, at the time, I was just fit, wrapping up like this web design class at Parsons. So I brought on two of my former students, Fran Rivera and Jasmine Khan, to design the website. And I think they did a phenomenal job here. Um, so again, I think it's really uh, rewarding the way all of these different uh, facets of my career come together uh, when it comes to my work. Uh, but also bringing, being able to bring in students as well. Um, another recent example uh, was the uh, campaign identity for uh, TikTok's Latin Heritage Month um, campaign uh, that launched this September, uh, this past September. Um, and for this project, I brought on three of my former students, Michelle Castellanos, Andrew Contreras, and Humberto Ochoa. Um, and here we could see uh, the identity we created. Um, this, when TikTok approached us, um, they already had this ongoing hashtag called Casa TikTok for the last couple of years. And so for this project, we were not only making the visuals, but also coming up with uh, the campaign name. And so um, we explored many different directions, but we landed on this phrase, adelante, which is a phrase that you use to greet somebody when you're opening the door to your home, which just means like, come on in, but it also means like onward or forward. Um, we brought in the uh, inverse and upright exclamation marks, uh, just because it's a very um, special and unique thing to the Spanish language. For the leather forms, we took inspiration from uh, different signages throughout Latin America. For the main artwork, we were um, looking at, uh, once again, architecture, but throughout Latin America, like the top right one is a museum in Brazil. I think the top left one is an uh, image in Mexico, and then also the textile art from Central America. And so for this project, um, it was really wonderful to have this bigger team uh, where I brought on my former students because uh, they come from different cultural backgrounds. And often when we see these um, Latin history or Latin, Latin history month campaigns, many times they are very like Mexico centric. Um, and, you know, there's so many other countries that should be included as well. So I love that we were able to bring in perspectives from like Honduras and El Salvador and Ecuador. So I thought that's what, ma what made the project really special as well. 
Um, and then one of my favorite aspects of this was the uh, photo illustration system we built. Uh, so we were being very conscious of sometimes with these uh, like cultural heritage months, they can almost become a caricature of your own identity. And we wanted to avoid that. So we chose not to uh, like make little illustrations or anything like that. Instead, we went with a photography uh, route and specifically uh, all of us working on it went back and we took photos in our own homes or had our family members send us photos. So like on the right here, these are the deals that Michelle's grandma was making. So I just really love that, you know, her grandma's just like trying to make breakfast or something. And now these three deals are out in the world, out in the campaign, which I thought was really fun. Like the artwork on the right is one that Umberto's mom made, I think in from like a, materials from a market in Mexico City. So we have all of these different little um, sort of like Easter eggs in our design, which are really special to the team. Um, but I think it also just added this level of warmth and humanity to the design, which is really nice. Um, and we try to be as inclusive as possible. So like the textile on the left, that's from Panama. So we're really trying to include um, different elements from all the different uh, countries because the Latin identity is so vast and diverse. And we also created uh, many different assets, including some of these uh, social posts. And for this design, you know, the motion, we wanted it to take a step back. So we just went with a really simple uh, motion system. And here we could see some more of the designs. Again, my uh, team members here were very kind enough to be the models for the designs. They volunteered, I guess they wanted to do that. Um, so yes, very grateful for uh, the incredible team that we had here. And yeah, this project was just a lot of fun to see all of the different elements come together. Um, and to me, projects like this is, I could have easily just done this by myself, but it wouldn't have been, I think, anywhere as rich in context and it definitely wouldn't have been as fun to just create this by myself. And uh, lastly, I also wanted to um, circle back to this idea of design education. And one thing I've been really passionate about these last few years have been uh, thinking about how we can make design education more accessible. And for me, that has been uh, putting on workshops. So I'm very grateful to Teach Up Parsons. I think it's an incredible institution. Uh, that is, you know, currently being led by the director, Kelly Walters, who's also an incredible author who I referenced in the article and also in some of those books I shared earlier. Um, but at the end of the day, Parsons is still a highly privileged and highly uh, specialized school that not everybody has access to attend. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a first generation college student. I come from a working class background. There's just absolutely no way I would have ever been able to uh, attend a design school like Parsons, uh, to even probably attend school out of state. Um, and I think that's uh, that this type of resources shouldn't be limited to those uh, to a small group of students who can afford that kind of uh, educational luxury. And uh, one thing I've been really passionate about has been trying to uh, find ways to bring, especially when it comes to these new emerging technologies, um, this skill set uh, back to Mexico. So uh, in 2022, I held this on the left, this free workshop with the help of my friends, uh, Michael and Matt uh, over at Republic, uh, which is a studio in Mexico City. Uh, this was just a really fun workshop where the students were learning the intro to AR and this was really important to me because the software that we see here, um, all of the instructions are in English, the software itself, it's still all in English. Um, so if you don't come from a very privileged background in Mexico, you probably don't speak English, which means you don't have access to be uh, exploring with these new technologies. Um, on the right, this past fall, I went back to Mexico and gave three workshops in three different cities. This was um, at a school and university in Veracruz. And again, I'm just a big believer that as these new emerging technologies continue to be released, um, it's really a disservice if we're only making these accessible to a small group of people. And 
uh, it's really important for all of us to work together however we can to share the knowledge and just bring in as much uh, as many different voices and perspectives um, so we can all have a say in how these technologies uh, continue to impact our lives. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Beatrice. I am just blown away. And I think that no matter what our fields of endeavor are, uh, we will all never think and uh, look at type uh, the same way as we think about how integral it is to every element of our communications. So I'm going to turn it over to Kara and Sam. Uh, we'll start out with uh, some of the questions we've prepared. And then, of course, online viewers, uh, please feel free, if you haven't already, to share questions you have for our guest speaker in the chat. Hi, Beatrice. Um, it was lovely to hear from you. Very inspiring. Um, and our, my first question for you is like you mentioned how your start in design was influenced by like uh, getting involved in social justice in college. But like, how did you start getting involved in these social justice related projects in your professional career? Like, were you approached like for the voting one with the voting poster? Or is it something that you were like actively seeking out? Yeah, um, I think it's a continuous cycle. So a lot of my, I feel very fortunate that a lot of my professional or commercial work oftentimes is a reflection of my personal work. So uh, I think creating a lot of personal projects is really important because it shows people what you're interested in. It shows them what you're capable of doing. Um, and so I think initially that started off with me taking on a lot of like pro bono or just you know, collaborating with friends. I was working with an immigrant rights organization in Michigan called One Michigan, where I recently did their rebranding. Um, and so like sharing all of that work then leads to like commercial clients like ESPN being like, oh, we really love that branding you did for the immigrant rights group. Can you do one about like women's rights for us? Um, so initially, yeah, I think you definitely need to put in the work when it comes to the personal projects. Um, and uh, yeah, typically it's, I find that really helpful uh, just to show people what you're interested in. Thank you. Um, on a kind of similar note to this idea of people um, sort of reaching out to you versus you trying to find a job, um, when you have an offer for a job, how do you decide when to take a job? um maybe if it's like ethics or the money or like all these different um things that could influence that yeah um great question i mean honestly i really do think it just comes to your intuition you just have to trust your intuition um and if something looks good on paper i can almost probably guarantee it might not be the best option i think when it came came to my career I turned, have turned down many jobs that were much more comfortable, that paid better to take on smaller jobs, even if it meant I had to get a side job or something on the, to you know, pay my income. But especially when you're first starting off, I would say the most important thing is to look for jobs that can really help you grow and learn. Um, and I would say worry less about the pay and the money because that will come in the future. Um, but if I think if you're so like hyper focused, like on the name, like the title of a place or the money, you're going to cap yourself really early on in your career. And then you're going to stay stagnant, you know, maybe, you know, stay at a senior role for many, many years. Uh, but if you take those risks and continue to jump around, um, you can grow into more of those leadership roles uh, earlier on. Another question um, that I have, shifting focus a little bit more, um, I also have a very big um, interest in typography. And so I was really interested in what is your process like in designing a font and a variable font and like what made you choose to start designing fonts? Because for me, I feel like it's a very daunting task, but I have a very big appreciation for typography. So I'm really interested in that process. Yeah, um, well, happy to hear that we have a typographer amongst us. <laughs> um, I think for me, it's at least 
my university didn't offer a type design class or type design program, but I think, you know, nowadays there's so many resources online, so many uh, great uh, classes and just websites that can walk you through that process. I think the most important part would be one to just start making things. When I first started, I started like sketching a sketchbook. Then I went to Illustrator because it was the only tool that I knew how to work with. And then eventually I moved over the glyphs, which is like a professional standard type design tool. I think they have great discounts for students. If you're interested, you should definitely look into them. But um, yeah, it also, I think it wouldn't have been possible without I had a lot of like mentorship along the way when they came to type design. Uh, as I mentioned, like working at Morcos Key, like with Wild Morcos, he's an incredible type designer. He, I'm not sure if he still does, but he previously was working at commercial type, making all of their uh, different Arabic typefaces. Um, and when I was working with him, I remember he was like, oh, so you're interested in designing typefaces. He's like, pull up your Illustrator file. I want to see the points. And I was like so embarrassed. I was like, oh no. And then he clicked on it and it was like a horrible hot mess. But I'm like, that's the only way we can learn. Um, so I think, you know, again, it's okay to like, you know, not be great when you're starting off. That's the whole point. Um, but I think just continuing to make and iterate. And I think also with typefaces, it's um, just like really coming up with a strong concept. That's so like, why are you designing this typeface? Since there's so many typefaces already out there. Like, why do you feel the need to make a new one? Like, what's your perspective on it? And um, yeah, also just taking the time to study what's out there. So, you know, 10 different type lectures, check out different type books um, before you dive into the design process as well. Thank you. Yeah. The um, typography that you showed, especially in your presentation, was just, you know, amazing and incredible. Um, and I guess, you know, there's so many different f fields and niches for, you know, design and artwork. Um, but what about typography stuck out so much to you? And, you know, why did you choose that specifically as one of your you know, passions and for one of the main aspects of your career? Yeah, yeah. Um... You know, I feel like it just kind of happened. I think it, as we move on in our career, it's important to have like an open mind. So when I first moved to New York, I was like, I'm a brand designer and that's what I love. And then all of the work I kept making was so typography focused and everybody's like, oh, so your thing is type. And now sometimes people are like, so your thing is AR. I'm like, oh, well, if you mention it, I guess, I guess it is. Um, so I think it's just a matter of just making whatever interests you. Um, at least for me with typography, I just find it very interesting because there's so many layers of information that we can convey. So we have, you know, the words that they are literally spelling out, but also the style in which we draw them has a different connotation. There's also different histories, uh, especially associated with different like countries, different movements. And then on top of that, in the last few years, there's also been this huge push for kinetic typography. So for motion, I know you're interested in film. I'm sure you're, you have a lot of references. Uh, I'm a big fan of like film titles as well and how we could tell the story or set up a story using simple animation and their choice in typography. Thank you. I have another question. Um, since you work a lot with variable fonts, and I find very font variable fonts very interesting because of their dynamic nature. Um, but I was wondering, how do you think variable fonts will evolve over time? And how do you think it would impact the future of typography design? Yeah, so it's funny, because I was just at Portland this past weekend, and another student asked the same question. Um, I think we're all still trying to figure it out. Honestly, when it comes to variable fonts, um, I think not a lot of people actually use them the way they were intended to be used. Most people, when they purchase a typeface, they won't even use the, t the variable font the way it's meant to be used. They'll just want like the bold version or the regular version. The nice thing with variable fonts is that it allows you to really select any weight that you want. So you can really make a really you know intentional uh, visual identity. For me, what interests me with variable fonts is this connection to code. So I'm also very interested in like, creative coding. So once you begin 
um, making interactive designs on the web with variable fonts, you can then connect it to different um, inputs. So I've experimented, I didn't show it in the deck, but like variable fonts that react to audio. So now it goes from like thin to bold based on audio input. Um, you can also think about it more when it comes to um, like motion and animation. So I think the construction of leather forms are really important. And if you've ever played around in like After Effects or animation tools, you can easily like slap effects on the design and it's like make it wavy or make it do something and it just warps your design. But with a variable font, you know, we don't just have to think about it like thin and bold. We can think about it, you know, it's not expressive to very expressive. And even the wavy expressive version is still very intentional. All the points are still drawn there. Um, so yeah, I think it just gives us a lot of possibilities more, I would say in the world of like motion or interaction design. I'm going to bring in a question from our viewing audience on YouTube. And one of our viewers has asked, Based on the data that you showed about the significant differences in demographic representation that have historically occurred in the design field, what do you think some of the factors are and what systemic changes do you think can help begin to better address the disparity? Yeah, well, what great question. I think uh, the person who asked that touched on all the important points because it really is a systemic issue. I think sometimes when it comes to these disparities, when it comes to racial representation, people get a little nervous or they're like, I'm a good person. It's not that I'm a bad person or I'm not racist. And it's really not about that. It's about the systems that we have built and that we're functioning within these larger systems. Um, and I think one thing I've recognized throughout the years is the importance of trying to make spaces and uh, that are inclusive as early on as possible. Um, so I think the difficult part with that kind of uh, breakdown is that at that point, students have already applied into college. So I think we need to take even like one step back before then and begin to examine, you know, like how do we re reach out to high school students? So. Uh, this past year, I've been doing some work with uh, the University of Michigan, where I went to school with their high school outreach programs, um, because similarly, I was like, hey, you know, there's not enough uh, BIPOC students applying for your high school programs. Um, what can we do to reach out to them? Um, so, yeah, I think to begin with, we really have to step back and start like at a high school level, uh, ideally even you know, like freshmen to help them prepare so they will have a strong portfolio to apply to art school. And then when they're juniors and seniors, uh, many of these students don't even know that there's so many opportunities like high school summer programs at all of these great universities. Um, it's just that the word never reaches them, that kind of information never reaches them. So I think a big part lies on these big institutions to put in more work for uh, intentional outreach. Um, and then once the students reach a university level, I think, uh, it's really uh, important to help help them excel in their career. So ideally connecting them with internships at a, at a earlier stage in their career uh, or just connecting them with professionals who are out in the field working. And I do want to thank Neo Tamita for bringing that question to you. Something that's, I think, on everyone's mind a lot these days is sort of where technology is going in the future, especially with stuff like artificial intelligence. Um, and I was wondering, what is your opinion on sort of the future of design and especially, you know, typography and augmented reality and how this could, you know, be changed, sort of your career maybe could be changing in the future um, and especially how technology such as AI could affect um, your design. Yeah, great. Um, I think all of our careers are going to be impacted in ways that like we can't wrap our minds around. Even the people designing this technology don't fully understand, you know, how it's going to impact our careers. Um, as I mentioned, I've been working as a freelance independent designer. And this past year, I was jumping around different agencies. And 
I realized that in this past year now, everybody's required to know how to work with these AI tools. And that wasn't the case, you know, a year before that. It also allows you to work at a pace that's so much quicker than before. So I remember I was working on this project where I was uh, masking out a video, uh, like silhouetting a video. And a couple of years ago when I was doing that for a project, it took me like three days where I was like frame by frame cutting somebody out. Now, I think I used like runway. It was like 10 minutes. It did four days of work in 10 minutes. Um, so I think that can also be, it worries me a lot, especially because I'm working with and teaching younger designers because a lot of my entry level jobs were just me, you know, essentially doing production work. So it does worry me because I'm like, these production jobs are no longer going to be there. So now we don't have these entry points for these young designers to get acclimated to these design jobs. Um, so I think it's only going to get more and more competitive to enter the design field, the creative field. Uh, I think, you know, it, it is an unstoppable change that's coming for us. And um, one thing I'm trying to teach my students in the 3D class right now is the importance of our con conceptual design and the importance of being able to be intentional with our designs because um, it's now becoming less about actually executing the craft and more about is your idea really strong and rooted in something um, that will resonate with other people. And then when it comes to typography and AR, I think we're just moving into more like interactive space when it comes to design. So as I mentioned, like variable fonts that react to audio, uh, I think we're seeing more, especially as we, as we spend more and more time on our screens, design is just shifting to a much more uh, interactive space. And these technologies are allowing us to uh, just make things that are, I think, in a way, much more inclusive, uh, I think, and engaging in ways that we couldn't have done before. Thank you so much. The time has flown by this evening. I think one of the biggest impressions seeing uh, the variable type, the collaborative projects, and the dynamism of topography for me as a writer and historian, it really underscores that language is a living embodied entity that shapes not only our conception of the world, but gives form to our thinking and interaction with the world and the ways in which the material you've shown us tonight shows us how breaking out of those Eurocentric Latin style fonts and approaches broadens how we relate to and engage with the world. So that's been uh, a real big takeaway from for me. And I don't know if Heather is still with us and uh, would like to uh, usher us out or if I should uh, take on that role. I'm going to take on that role. All right. So again, thank you so much, Beatrice, for your talk this evening and uh, for inviting us into this dynamic and essential aspect of design, particularly your thinking with regard to collaboration, making our communicative expressions more accessible both for designers and for the audiences who engage with the media around us. It's been extraordinarily inspirational and we thank you for being so generous in your time and advice. And I would definitely like to thank Sabrina Clemens, our event producer behind the scenes, Heather Elliott Famolaro, our director who led us off, and also Kara and Sam for moderating. 
Everyone online is invited to join us Wednesday, April 3rd at 5.30 for our next Diverse Perspectives speaker, Lisa Elsie Mercer, an Associate Professor of Graphic Design and Design for Responsible Innovation at the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Please check out the entire lineup past and forthcoming of our Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series at dmd.ucon.edu backslash diverse. And don't forget to subscribe to us here on YouTube and follow our other social media channels at DMD to see all of our department's great content. And you'll see those links in the YouTube chat. And again, thanks to our students and everyone who worked together to produce this great event. And most of all, thank you to those of you in our virtual audience for joining us today. I hope that we and you are as inspired about Beatriz's work and insights as we are here on Zoom. There is work to be done, but if we continue to inspire and mentor our young creatives together, we can hopefully change this digital world for the better. Goodbye and good night.